Tom, Tom is a, uh, a person that I probably have the most admiration for. I put him in the top, top people I've ever met. He is incredibly dedicated. He's courageous. And we don't think about courage in science. But it's not only courage to say what you think. It's courage to pursue your ideas, per courage to go to the field, confront disease and misery and poverty, and come back with something positive. And that's what Tom has done. Um, so without further ado, let me jump into what you cannot find in the National Library of Medicine uh, search. In this, this epic poem of Tennyson, uh, all experiences an archway through gleams that untraveled margin. So let's join with Tom back when he was an undergraduate and he had hair. So this is actually Tom Monath. He'll say it's not him, but this is from a slide which I found in his collection. This is Tom as he was setting forth for expeditions to Central America, South America, and Africa. So this is where it all began. This is the famous uh, Harvard uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, his mentor was Professor Ernest Williams. And in that, in that basement, Tom realized his first love, which was to study amphibians and things that crawl around on their belly like snakes. He actually organized four expeditions from the National Ge Geographic Society and set forth on these expeditions and actually uh, got, further, got his friends to go from Tennyson's poems, it's not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows. And Tom has been doing that now for 60 plus years. So Tom's first expeditions had nothing to do with tropical medicine. He was snake collecting. So it all begins in the cold morning. How many people here have been to Africa? So it's a really lovely place. And, and there are places that are cool. And so Tom was in Ethiopia with his fellow uh, snake hunters. He got up before everyone else and said he would start the day collecting these interesting herpetological specimens. So the herps were sluggish, it's cool, everyone's sleeping. And he found a cute little snake, if there is such a thing, and let it run back and forth between his hands. And he said, being Tom Monath, there was complete certitude of what it was. So this is a... Uh, a blind African snake, which is actually harmless. It's found all in all through uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So Tom, of course, puts it in a bag after he's played with it, puts it in a pickle jar, goes back and sees the famous Dr. Smith that you saw earlier. And Tom is in his studies, and he gets summoned to see Dr. Smith. And he says, hey, Tom, you know, Tom's his star pupil. And he says, Tom, what is this? And he says, oh, this is the harmless uh, blind African tiplops. And he says, you dumb SOB. He says, I almost lost my best student. This is the most dangerous snake in Africa. And this is probably the one time in all of history where Tom didn't know the complete literature because 15 years earlier, the head of the Chicago Zoo had picked up the exact same snake and gotten one dr drop of venom and died in 15 hours. So we're glad you're with us, Tom. And, <laughs> But never let it be said, Tom doesn't learn from experience. So um, <clears throat> he uh, came under the influence of tropical medicine people, which is an obscure part of medicine, but it's probably the most important. And on his return from one of his trips, he was sitting in class at Harvard Medical School. And Tom's tolerance for, for boring people was pretty well known even then. And he, just jumped, he would jump up and leave the class if it was too slow. But Tom de developed shaking chills, rigors, a headache, and I think you know where we're going with this. He had malaria. He was really sick. Um, so I'll condense the story in the interest of time, but Tom, uh, Tom goes to student health, and of course no one says, where have you been? And they said, you've got, you've got mononucleosis. That's why your spleen's so big. So Tom goes, goes home. He's sick as a dog. His friends carry him to the emergency room. He gets admitted. They do a smear, and it's 5 malaria. Tom gets admitted to the ward. He goes, wow, this is pretty interesting. And they give him any malarial medicines. The second night develops severe acute abdomen. Has anyone here had abdominal surgery before? It's, it's not fun. So Tom gets a severe abdominal pain. And uh, um, the resident comes in and says, I think you may have ruptured your spleen. You need a full exam, abdominal rectal. And so uh, the senior resident says, that's Tom Monath. I better check him out. So he checks him out. And then the two surgical residents come, and they check him out. And then they do serial exams. And then they decide his spleen may have ruptured. And they put a needle in his belly, and they can't get any blood out. So Tom's not having a good time. 
And uh, the second day comes, he's feeling slightly better, and the nurse tries to give him someone else's medicine. And Tom, at this point, is upset. And he calls his fiance and says, we're out of here. And that he gets dressed, checks out against medical advice, and uh, he's about to go home. And there is a big placard that says, Malcolm X, the famous activist, is speaking. And Tom says, that would be interesting. And she says, no, you're sick. And he says, no, let's get in line. We should go hear this guy. So Tom gets in line. 10 seconds later, he hits the floor, hits his head. And they uh, admit him to the emergency room at the Brigham. And he's right back in the bed where, where he started. <laughs> so why am I telling you this story? Because Tom, you heard Amy talk about his great humility. But this is where he acquired it. He, he understood what it's like to be a patient. He understood uh, the importance of tropical medicine, and he finally got his badge of honor. He'd had a real tropical disease. <laughs> so let's move on to. So when you try and characterize Tom's life and bring some semblance to it, some order to it, I really think if you look at Tom's 25 years at the CDC and then as the uh, director of, of virology at Fort Detrick, uh, director of the, uh, the special pathogens lab, Tom was the consummate explorer, whether it was in South America, uh, Africa, Asia, the United States. Tom defined diseases, and he did it in a way that only a consummate field virologist could. He understood their ecology. He understood the impact on people, um, everything from viral sequencing to the immune response. And this was Tom's trademark. Tom's baptism by fire, I think, was it started with, uh, with loss of fever, and over a series of years, he, was a, he investigated outbreaks in, in, uh, in West Africa. Uh, Kent Campbell is there, and you'll hear more about him in a minute, but this is just a typical thing. I know it's hard for many of us who study, get our PhDs or MDs without ever getting abroad, but Tom immediately got out in the field, and when he arrived in the city, it was complete shutdown. There was panic in the streets. Nurses and, uh, and patients were dying of Lhasa. Uh, goods and services were closed. And Tom and the EIS buddies show up. And these uh, Catholic uh, Irish nuns were delighted to see him. And he immediately went about doing what Tom does best. He organized the, uh, uh, they helped organize the isolation wards. They began to describe the pathogenesis of the disease, diagnostics. Um, and they began to search for where the reservoir was. Next slide. So. I just put these details in because this was Tom's modus operandi for all his outbreaks. And he did encephalitis in South America, uh, the United States, and, in, and, and uh, in West Africa. I'd like to point out that we always think of Tom as the 100% example that we all should follow. And I would just point out, if you look at that red uh, circle there, Tom is always saving money. And he always said, it's just a BSL-4 pathogen. I'll just wear one glove. And you can. <laughs> You can see his friends there have taken a similar, similar view. Um, on this particular expedition, Tom was looking for the reservoir. He didn't find it on this, but he did later. And as you know, he did describe the multi-mammate uh, rat as a, as a source. Uh, I'd like to come forward and give you another light moment. Imagine yourself as director of the CDC. And you get a call in the middle of the night that says one of your star officers is uh, not doing well. He's in a hospital in a foreign land. It's England, and it's a very prestigious hospital and they don't know what they're doing, and you have to get this guy out and bring him back to the States, because he could have loss of fever, which, as you recall, doesn't have a specific treatment at this time that had been proven. So who are you going to call? Next. So Ken Campbell, which many of you knew or know, uh, fresh from Lhasa, had been hospitalized. He'd been uh, doing sero surveys and had ended up in the London hospital and was not happy. Next slide. So this is Tom Monath. This is who you got to call. Next. So for those of you not familiar with NASA or space flight, this is the actual module that Apollo astronauts were quarantined in. So of course, you call up Tom Monath. You send him. You call up the uh, NASA mobile quarantine facility. They go, well, it's not an aquatic amphibious vessel. What do you do? Next slide. You get Tom to bring over a 141. So Tom, Tom the plane, and the module arrive. He says, hey, Kent. He goes, hey, Tom. He says, you don't look very sick. He goes, well, I don't know. I don't feel good. So he says, he did, and he flies him back home. That's what Tom does. And I really think the most amazing story isn't the fun of riding around in a big plane, is that Tom's uh, skills are not all in medicine. 
this was a very sensitive thing. So some of the preeminent physicians in, in uh, London were involved in the care. And essentially, Tom had to say, we want to bring our guy back to the States. And Tom pulled it off to, to a good accord, became lifelong friends. I think Tom's heart is in, is in yellow fever. If you looked at National Library of Medicine, he has 129 publications. 90 of them are on vaccines or some aspect of it. I think this is what really moved him to look for the eventual moving him to the quest for vaccines. Tom spent two years in Nigeria, made lifelong friends, established protocols and collaborations. Uh, there's Tom in the middle there. Next slide. Um, Tom was always someone that made friends wherever he went, and uh, these are lifelong connections, and he understood the disease not only from the pathophysiology, but from its impact in the community. And you have to get out in the field to do it. Next slide. Uh, this is friend, uh, Tom's friend, Peter Tukai, with all the graves. There's the yellow fever ripped through uh, Nigeria where he was. Uh, Tom was the relentless scientist. Here is a, a, a patient he was attending who died, and with the family's permission, he took a specimen to correlate that virus with a particular uh, clinical presentation. Next slide. Um, Tom was very moved by yellow fever, and uh, I won't read this to you, but uh, um, you can imagine what the roads were like. Tom not only uh, went from hospital to hospital, he did serosurveys surveys to understood the, uh, the spread, the uh, inapparent and apparent spread of yellow fever. Um, some of the, uh, if you read some of his uh, accounts, he was going through Nigeria when it was the Civil War and banditry was everywhere. And so he drives around at night in these vehicles and uh, would turn back when they ran and they could anticipate a roadblock. So it's quite an intrepid undertaking. Next slide. Um, Okay, so how many here have had to read or, or write an ICF, informed consent form? Anybody? So we, you do phlebotomy, you go, that's easy. Nobody can make that difficult. But Tom, Tom found a way. So um, Tom, Tom pulled into the village, it was the Enugu outbreak, and uh, Tom went to the village, went to the village chief, all the elders, and said he'd like to do a survey. They said, fine. Um, they did all the adults, and he's, the next day he said, this is great, can we do the school children? They said, sure, and they went up and met the schoolmaster. Everyone wanted to volunteer, and uh, Tom is drawing blood on this student uh, there. And all of a sudden, they hear a noise from the village below. And his driver busts in and says, Dr. Tom, we got to go. And Tom says, well, what do you mean we got to go? He says, we got to go, we'll go. So Tom starts to pick up stuff, he goes, we got to go. And so what had happened is Tom had not involved the ladies of the, uh, the village, and he looked out the window, and 50 angry mothers were there because we wanted to know what Tom and the whole team was doing with, uh, with, the, with the kids, and they had machetes and sticks. So Tom left his equipment. I'm not sure what the uh, property book officer said, but Tom got away. Next slide. And this is, this. if you read the epic, the journals of Tom, this is the power wagon, and they made their escape. And, uh, and that's fourth, he's always included the women in the village in his uh, surveys. Next slide. All, all kidding aside, Tom is a leader by example. There's nothing that I've worked with him for eight years that he'll ask you to do that he hasn't done or won't do if, if you're in a bind. Um, Tom was investigating a vesicular stomatitis virus outbreak in uh, the United States and decided that they needed to do sero surveys in the, uh, in the uh, animals that were affected. It was also a time when C. Everett Koop insisted that people wear their uniform, and Tom, of course, not only did that, he made sure all of his, all of his people had sufficient ribbons and medals so they didn't look like airline stewards, but you know they looked, looked pretty spiffy. So Tom is out one day. It's the day, you know, remember one day of the week he wore your uniform. Tom is knocking doors in Midwest America. And a lot of them didn't like the feds uh, coming there in their uniforms asking to mess with their animals. And so the doors would be slammed. And occasionally, though, people would say, yeah, my animals are sick. You can look at them. So Tom was with uh, Patricia Webb, who many of you knew. And uh, they had bled all the cows. And they finally got a pig farmer that said, go for it. So Tom <clears throat> goes out to the pig pen, and of course, being the director, says, uh, Pat, wouldn't you like to get in the pig pen and draw the blood from the, uh, from, from the pig? And she said, well, actually, she'd like to see how it was done. So, uh, so Tom, of course, you know, he is really smart, but he's a Harvard guy. There are not a lot of farms at Harvard. So Tom, 
Tom looks at the pig, pig looks at Tom, Tom approaches from the rear, you know, outside the field of vision. You don't do that with animals. So he puts his hand on the rump of the pig, gets his back retainer, picks up the tail. I would have gone for a juggler, Tom, but anyway, picks up the tail, inserts the needle, and the pig squealed bloody murder. Tom involuntarily grabs the, uh, <laughs> grabs the pig's tail and gets, next slide, please, and gets, gets uh, treated to a sleigh ride through the slurry. I don't have a picture, but I have no good authority this really happened. So um, Tom is not above real field work. All right, next slide, please. I think the reason we're here tonight, all joking aside, is to honor Tom for his incredible contributions to science. And I think especially the pathos of yellow fever, as well as the other diseases, prompted him to really learn what it was to be a biomedical executive, to be a leader, to be a chief scientist, to be a vaccine development uh, VP. And Tom was like a, a pig in mud. He, uh, he went uh, to Oravax. Uh, a canvas, and he really made some material uh, contributions which pe millions of people around the world benefit from today. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I think if Albert Sabin were here, he would say, uh, this is a scientist who does not rest while knowledge might be used to reduce suffering. Uh, and this is Tom, always looking to apply the technologies. So I'm going to touch briefly on some of these. Uh, Tom is still working on a NIPA vaccine in Marburg with uh, public health vaccines. And uh, Joan Fusco is here with us tonight, and Tracy Kemp, and some of our collaborators. Tom never forgot, despite his being enamored of the field, the laboratory or the field, he always managed to integrate the two. Next slide. Um, ACAM 2000, I mean, that's an hour lecture. Tom could tell you stories in the bar all night long. Tom actually enjoyed such a position of privilege with our government, which he rarely talks about. But not only did he, if you look on C-SPAN, he, he testified to Congress. Um, the head of the, George Tenet at the CIA would call him in routinely to ask about the threats from the Soviet Union as uh, it was breaking up. Uh, Tom uh, participated in exchange programs with the Soviets to really understand. And many people forget that we had, we had stopped smallpox vaccine production um, and Tom uh, interviewed uh, Ken Ellibach, as did some of you probably that are here tonight, and realized that there were tons of sm uh, smallpox, tons of smallpox being manufactured in the, in the Soviet Union. And you can imagine what that would have done. If you can't imagine, I direct your attention to the graph at the bottom right, which is from the famous paper called uh, Dark Winter, which was published in uh, uh, the Journal of Infectious Disease. And essentially what it says that is the terrorists had released smallpox in three shopping malls in the US within 10 weeks, there would have been 3 million people um, affected, a million people dead, and social chaos. So this is what Tom recognized and the US government recognized. And Tom, um, while working at a canvas, led a team to remanufacture the smallpox vaccine and to stock the strategic national stockpile. And it's not to be underestimated the value of the deterrent if you're ready for a problem. And so I think we can all thank Tom and his team at Acambus for driving this forward. Uh, this vaccine has also had recent utility for monkeypox. Uh, there's nothing worse than a disease that, that affects our brain. And Japanese encephalitis is very ugly for those that have uh, symptomatic in, in infections in, with encephalitis. Tom devised Chimerivax, which was essentially the vector uh, upon which uh, dengue and JE and West Nile vaccines were made. Uh, this is a commercialized vaccine, and again, uh, it was Tom and his team, and that's the other quality Tom has. He always pulls together the best, uh, with few exceptions like myself, but he brings together the best people, and they work together harmoniously, and uh, because Tom doesn't put his ego out front, he brings the best out in people, and so uh, this is Chimerivax. I think many of you are aware of it. Also built from the Chimerivax uh, backbone was the dengue vaccine. And this, of course, was transitioned to, uh, to Sanofi. But it was Tom's and his team which devised this uh, construct and advanced it through its early stages. And now it's, uh, of course, is, uh, is licensed. Uh, next slide, please. This is, this is where it was really fun for me. This is where I really got to know Tom. Tom uh, asked me to join his team at uh, New Link Genetics. And Tom, um, Tom was the senior scientist and the leader of the team. 
And now we worked, to, uh, we all worked together, and again, Joan and Tracy are here tonight, uh, but we transitioned it to Merck. And Tom's contributions are more than you can imagine. It's everything from the CMC matters to preclinical studies to understand the vaccine, uh, clinical design, regulatory approaches, the regulatory development plan. And Tom is always looking for the intellectual challenge. And so uh, there were numerous international consortia to look at the uh, signatures, the transcriptomics of the vaccine, and Tom played a prominent role in this as well. So um, we were all delighted, of course, when uh, Merck got this across the line and got the, uh, the PRV, but I think Tom was a, a major driver of that. And, um, and uh, I think it's just worth uh, saluting his activities there as well. So in conclusion, my premise is Tom is a modern Ulysses whose unending quest continues today as he looks for new opportunities through this arch and the opportunities to make the world better for all of us. Thank you, Tom. So before you talk, Tom, you can stay here. I'm gonna just put this gold medal on you. First of all, Gray, thank you for an amazing introduction. Gray's been an incredible friend and a source of wisdom and practicality and a stal stalwart uh, warrior in the uh, development of vaccines and working with me now for almost a decade. And thank you, Amy, for your uh, generous words and recognition and presentation of this amazing award. I'm obviously humbled and thrilled uh, to be the recipient of the Sabin Award gold medal. And I just want to point out that while the honor is bestowed upon me, it's really the many, many people who I've worked with who deserve a lot of the credit. Um, the development of a vaccine is obviously a very complex thing and depends on people with uh, different competencies and skills. And uh, so their support has always been really critical. Some of them are here today. Um, Gray, of course, Tracy Kemp, who never do a clinical trial without her help. Um, Sasha Mancia, uh, Simon Delagrave is here. Um, so many people have come from far away. Juan Arroyo, who helped uh, develop the chimeric flavivirus vaccine. Uh, Janine Davis, who was my uh, executive assistant for many years and kept me on schedule, something I'm absolutely hopeless at doing myself. Um, and I think the Sabin Vaccine Institute for this honor, but also for the work it's done to foster progress of vaccines for people in low-income countries, something which has been a major focus of my life, obviously, and an interesting career. I've had many mentors over the years uh, who have accomplished far more than I have, uh, just to name a few, Hillary Kaprosky, Tom Weller, Harvard, Maurice Hilleman, Phil Russell, Neil Nathanson, D.A. Henderson, and Stan Plotkin. And, um, you know, their accomplishments are far greater than mine um, and have provided me an example and encouragement and leadership over the years. I didn't know Albert Sabin personally, but I always think of him as an arbovirologist, and that's really where he started. He worked on dengue during World War II Japanese encephalitis uh, during an outbreak of JE in Okinawa and World War II affected both the military and civilians. He developed a vaccine, early vaccine. He immunized over 70,000 people. And um, I always thought of that as an example of how you, uh, a vaccine could be such an important instrument in controlling an, an outbreak or epidemic. Um, and, uh, you know, re really honored to have worked on that same disease years later. Um, we're at an age of fast-moving scientific achievements in, in knowledge of immunology and vaccine development, but the greatest challenge is still 
how to make those how to make new vaccines available uh, to uh, people, particularly in underserved populations. And other challenges include just improved understanding of the impact of infectious disease so that we can justify the huge costs of developing a vaccine against them. Um, we need to decomplicate the regulatory process to speed up development and find the right balance between anticipating uh, and preventing emergencies and responding to them. So I, I learned a lesson early in my career. I'd like to just tell you a, a story. <laughs> not that Gray has not told you many, but um, I was only a few years out of my residency in internal medicine when I went to Nigeria, as you heard, and worked on yellow fever at the Rockefeller Virus Laboratory in Abaddon. Uh, that was attached to the University College Hospital in medical school, which was the leading institution in Nigeria at the time. And one night, uh, my driver, who was assigned to me from the smallpox eradication program in that power wagon, um, drove up to my house late at night. He said, please come see my wife, who's obviously distressed. And I went out to the car, and it was quite clear, she'd just given birth a week before, that she had tetanus. And um, I took her to the university hospital, where I thought, you know, I did some sway. Uh, they wouldn't admit her. I took her to two private hospitals, they wouldn't admit her. Finally, she went into a government hospital and died the next day. And uh, the whole thing was so distressing, given the life-threatening situation, there was no immune globulin available. Um, but the fact that she had been a patient in the, out, in the prenatal care clinic at University Hospital, but had not been vaccinated against tetanus, really provided a lesson that, you know, it's not about, there's an effective vaccine, and uh, uh, a patient had not received it, and this is obviously an example that's repeated itself many, many times in, in Africa and elsewhere. So that less than motivated me ever since uh, that the that vaccine access was to underserved populations was so important and um, that even you know the availability of a, a good preventive vaccine is only the beginning step in the control of infectious diseases so finally I want to thank my family for their incredible support my wife, Blake, and who put up with too many hours in front of my computer over the years and traveling all over. Uh, my daughter, Andrea, is here, who went to Nigeria when she was six months old and has been a world traveler ever since and has an extraordinary career as an interior designer. My son, Nicholas, who somehow has mathematical genius despite my complete incompetence at it and is working at Google on artificial intelligence. My grandchildren, Calvin and Charlie, are here. Uh, also, my good friend, Michael Tauf, who um, traveled a long way here. And he's the guy I trampled around jungles with back in the day in our youthful quest for adventure. We both experienced malaria, and he inspired me to a lifetime of exploration. So thank you all, and thanks again for this great honor. Thank you.